Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to the second of Chiba's visiting lecture series. My name is Praminda Sashte, and I'm co-director of the Center for Healthy Brain Aging at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Before we begin the formal proceedings, I'd like to first acknowledge the Bedical people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which Chiba stands. And of course, this meeting is uh, virtual. So basically, the country all over Australia is recognized. And I pay tribute to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Now, today is a special honor for me to introduce Professor Ron Peterson, a leading light in dementia research. Uh, he's been described as a rock star of dementia research, and I don't think there's anyone in the field of dementia who does not know his name. And we will, are privileged to listen to him today, and then I have some time for question and answer. He is the director of the Mayo Clinic of Zama's Disease Research Center, and leads the Mayo Clinic study of aging, both of which involve the study and characterization of aging individuals over time with an emphasis on clinical parameters, neuroimaging and biomarkers. So I welcome you to this talk. Uh, the title of the talk will be Diagnosing Alzheimer's Disease in the Biomarker Era, Promises and Pitfalls. So following the talk, there is a live Q&A with Professor Peterson. So if you have any questions through the talk, please put them in to the Q&A function. So click the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen and type in your question. And I'll be collating those questions and towards the end, put them together for Professor Peterson to answer. So welcome, Professor Peterson. Well, thank you very much, Perminder, for those uh, kind words and really for the invitation from you and your team to join you in this discussion around Alzheimer's disease. I, uh, I, I'm sorry that I can't be there in person uh, because I believe you are beginning your summer. And of course, we here in Minnesota are entering into our winter uh, I would rather be there with you than enjoying the uh, months of ice and snow that we're looking at. Uh, so, again, thanks very much. And um, what I'd like to do is uh, discuss with you and your team today uh, the issue of Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's disease criteria. Are they changing for the better, for the worse, and where are we going? So here's the title of the talk that I'd like to uh, extend to you today and hopefully the Q&A will be uh, productive with regard to discussing some of the challenges with this issue. Here are my disclosures. On the left are some commercial entities with whom I interact largely regarding the design of clinical trials, data safety, monitoring committees for clinical trials and the like. But most of the information that I will relay today comes from our studies on uh, the Mayo Clinic Study of Aging, which is funded by the National Institute on Aging. So here's where I'd like to go today, uh, take you through a, sort of a, a brief history of where we are with making the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, and then move forward to where we are today. So when I began decades ago, uh, we were either classifying people as being cognitively normal or having dementia. And while we got better at making the diagnosis of dementia, meaning we made it earlier in the course, there still was this dichotomy. Either you were normal or you were somewhere in the demented range. Over the years, I think the field has come to realize that there's probably an intermediate category we've come to call mild cognitive impairment, where people are not quite what they used to be, but they're clearly not progressed into the dementia range. So these are individuals who we classify as having mild cognitive impairment. And, and as you and your team know very well, Perminder, uh, this refers to people who usually have a memory impairment beyond what we would expect for aging, but otherwise are functioning pretty well. And consequently, this has been a, a classification that has been entered into the system, but we all realize this is a continuum. And those 
boundaries between preclinical Alzheimer's disease, MCI, dementia, are arbitrary at best, and we all argue over what's what and which way do you go. But at the end of the day, I think the classification scheme generally works pretty well in clinical practice and, and in the research uh, domain as well. But over the past several decades, this is the dictum with which we have uh, operated with regard to making the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. This is the famous McCann paper in 1984, which characterized dementia and Alzheimer's disease. But back then, and over the years as we've been using these criteria, Alzheimer's disease has really been a clinical pathological entity. What do you mean by that? Well, it means that people generally fit the clinical criteria, the clinical course, meaning often a memory impairment, which may extend into areas of attention, concentration, language, uh, function as well. And then it extends into your activities of daily living. So people become functionally impaired. And when they reach that threshold, they're labeled as having dementia. Then we would undergo an exercise to try to rule out other causes of dementia. So we would do a scan or whatever, blood tests, to make sure the person didn't have a brain tumor, hydrocephalus, multiple strokes in the brain. If we didn't find any of that, or we didn't find any medical complications, we would then say this is probable Alzheimer's disease. We couldn't say definite because we didn't know for sure. You couldn't say definite until the person passed away had an autopsy, and you saw plaques and tangles in the brain. Then we call it definite Alzheimer's disease. This actually served the field pretty well for quite a few decades. And I think that uh, now we have advanced beyond that stage in the era of biomarkers. So in 2011, the National Institute on Aging and the Alzheimer's Association assembled some committees to kind of look at the criteria saying, gee, haven't we learned a lot in the last few decades about the underlying causes of cognitive impairment? Don't these biomarkers that we have at our, uh, our disposal these days really help us? So they generated three classification systems, one for preclinical Alzheimer's disease, one for MCI, and one for dementia, based on the presence or absence of amyloid, and the presence or absence of neurodegeneration. So this was a move forward, but still, at this phase, the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease was a clinical pathologic entity. A couple of years ago then, the NIA and the Alzheimer's Association uh, impaneled another committee to take a look at advances over those seven years. And they came to the conclusion that maybe it would be better for the field if we defined Alzheimer's disease biologically. That is, what is it? It's the presence of plaques made of amyloid, tangles made of tau. So if we see the presence of amyloid and tau, then in fact we're dealing with Alzheimer's disease. But the clinical spectra now are independent. So that's a big change. So here's the paper, again, in uh, Alzheimer's and dementia in 2018. That framework, though, was predicated on the so-called ATN framework. And the ATN framework hinges on biomarkers. So what are biomarkers? Well, biomarkers are, in this instance, are a measure of brain pathology obtained in the living subject. And these biomarkers are proxies for specific pathologic changes in the brain. For Alzheimer's disease, we're really talking about imaging or spinal fluid, biofluid, maybe uh, markers of the underlying disease entity. So again, my colleague, uh, Dr. Cliff Jack, uh, published this paper in uh, 2016, which really characterized what we mean by this ATN network. So really we're talking here about the A is referring to beta amyloid plaques, and you can detect that in the living patient in either CSF, so the person has an, a low A beta 42 rate, or a low 42 to 40 ratio would be indicative of Alzheimer's disease, or you can do an amyloid PET scan, and if it's positive, the person has evidence of amyloid. On the T side of the house, then, we have measures of aggregated tau, 
again, CSF phosphorylated tau, P tau. If that's high, that's indicative that uh, the tau uh, component of the disease process is present. Or more recently, the evidence on tau PET. So again, we can pick this up with uh, several imaging ligands that are available. So these are the two defining characteristics of Alzheimer's disease, the A and the T. But then there's the N. So the N refers to neurodegeneration, really pertains to how far the person is down the road. That is, if you're using structural MRI, does the person have hippocampal atrophy? Does the person have thinning of the cortical ribbon that may indicate that they are in fact advanced down the road? Or you could use FTG PET, that if people had a, a if the person had a particular pattern of hypometabolism, that might suggest that the person has a degenerative process, maybe Alzheimer's disease. Or in the CSF, you could look at an index of total tau. Again, total tau meaning degeneration, phosphorylated tau indicating specificity for the Alzheimer's disease process. So the N, though, is somewhat nonspecific. While it can give you an idea of how far the person has progressed in the amyloid tau pathway, uh, it can also arise from other neurodegenerative diseases. So it's not specific for Alzheimer's disease, but can be helpful. So the 2018 research framework, and again, I want to emphasize this is a research framework. So it's not been adopted in clinical practice, still needs to be validated. But basically, it's a scheme for defining A and T and staging N or clinical progression for the research community. So AD refers to a pathologic change in the brain, which can be obtained either by autopsy, postmortem, or with biomarkers. But the symptoms are not part of the disease definition. So this is a major shift in thinking for many of us, especially us clinicians, that this is in fact a different process. So if you think about A, T, and N, you can think about each one of them as being positive or negative. Now a whole discussion that I won't go into today, but underlies this whole concept is what is plus and what is minus? What's the threshold? What are you using? What's your measure, et cetera? So that's a big deal in the field, an important element. But for the sake of this discussion, let's say that we can define either A, T, and N as plus or minus, positive or negative. So given three categories, you've got eight combinations. And various terminologies are used to refer to these. So this is the Alzheimer's continuum, meaning that the person is A plus. Regardless of TNN, they're A+. Plus. So they're sort of on the Alzheimer's pathway, but we don't know where they are yet. Alzheimer's disease, then, is just a subset of those where you have A+, plus and T+. Plus. So that means the person has Alzheimer's disease. They can be N+, plus or N-, minus because, again, N is an index of neurodegeneration, uh, how far you are down the path, not a defining characteristic. So I've been talking a lot about these biomarkers. On the imaging side of the house, what are we looking at? What do we mean by this? Let's look at some of these then. Amyloid imaging. So here are PET scans. These are axial cuts of PET scans. Uh, I, for individuals on the far left here are cognitively normal, amnestic MCI, AD dementia. And what, again, these are axial cuts of PET scans. This yellow green stuff in the cognitively normal person refers to non-specific binding in the white matter, but not indicative of amyloid deposition in the brain. So that's a negative scan. But here in the amnestic MCI person, we do see some positivity. The redness here implies positivity in this scan. So this person does have amyloid in the brain. And of course, the person with AD dementia has florid redness, meaning positivity. Note these scans are called idealized because this is what we'd like to see in the real world, but in fact, that doesn't happen. So when you go out into the community and you study these individuals, you find all combinations of everything. So here we see in the upper left, cognitively normal person, negative scan, bottom left, 
cognitively normal person with a positive scan. So this is an individual who's normal, but has amyloid in the brain. Upper middle is an amnestic MCI person clinically who has a negative amyloid scan, and down below is a positive amyloid scan, and here's AD dementia. So you can have all different combinations of these biomarkers, and they may or may not coincide with the clinical picture. So the question for the field, questions for the field, regard these people down here, the cognitively normal, amyloid positive, amnestic MCI amyloid positive, are those people going to progress on to the dementia stage of the disease? And if so, when? Today, tomorrow, two years, five years, ever in their lifetime? Not sure we know the answer to that question yet. So amyloid imaging then, here is a depiction of the redness. Here's a, a sagittal cut looking at the brain anterior, posterior, the redness implies amyloid positivity. And here's the distribution of amyloid in an individual compared to a cognitively normal negative person. So this is where amyloid deposits in the brain. It's really pretty diffuse if you look at it. I mean, frontally, parietally, the sensory and motor strips are relatively spared in the disease, as we know from pathologic. Uh, confirmation. Tau imaging. So here are coronal cuts of tau images. Here's a cognitively normal person. This is just non-specific binding in the basal ganglia. Here's an individual with AD dementia who has positivity in the inferior temporal, middle, and superior temporal regions of so both sides. So this is a positive tau scan in somebody with AD dementia. And here's the distribution of the tau ligand. This is where tau deposits in the brain, not completely uh, overlapping with amyloid. And there may be more predilection actually in the temporal regions, medial temporal regions, as we know. So this gives complementary information to the amyloid scan. So this is what tau imaging looks like. This is what amyloid imaging, imaging looks like. And these are the defining characteristics of biologic Alzheimer's disease. What about the end now? What about staging the disease with neurodegeneration? Here we can look at MRI, we can look at FDG PET, and we can look at clinical syndromes. MRI, so here we are, we all see these scans every day in our, in our clinics. This is coronal cut of individuals with, with uh, uh, various degrees of atrophy. Here's a control, normal control, basically no significant atrophy in this 70-year-old. Here's a 72-year-old, a little bit of uh, medial temporal lobe atrophy here. The lateral ventricles are slightly enlarged compared to the normal person. And over here, we have AD dementia, a good deal of hippocampal atrophy, and generalized atrophy as well. So hippocampal volumes coming out of calculations on these types of images are actually pretty good at defining who is progressing and how far they are down the road. A more recent measure is looking at cortical thickness. So here in the uh, sagittal on the left, the coronal, the middle, and the axial on the right, these cuts, these areas defined in red now are areas of initial cortical thinning in Alzheimer's disease. So these are the regions of the brain that preferentially take the blunt of the disease and tend to thin. And you can put numbers on these and you can be pretty precise with regard to the cortical thickness measure. So here's a depiction now of where atrophy, cortical thinning in particular, presents in the brain of somebody with Alzheimer's disease relative to a cognitively normal individual. And here we see a predilection for the temporal lobe, temporal parietal regions, but it's quite different than what we see in amyloid and tau PET scans. And then finally, we can talk about functional imaging, FDG PET scans. So FDG PET scans tell us what part of the brain does what. So here on the bottom, we can look at uh, statistical renderings of metabolism in the brain. And here, blue-black is normal, but to the extent you see green, orange, yellow, red, 
we're seeing areas of hypometabolism, areas in the brain that are not functioning as well. The typical Alzheimer's pattern is here in the parietal and temporal region, less so on the right side. And when we get fancy, we can put numbers on it. And here's the distribution of hypometabolism in the brains of individuals with Alzheimer's disease, dementia, compared to cognitively unimpaired individuals. And again, here what we're seeing, a little bit of frontal activity, but most of the action is in the parietal and the temporal regions. So all of these scans, be they PET scans for amyloid and tau, MR, or PET scans for cerebral metabolism, they kind of put together a coalescing picture of what Alzheimer's disease looks like in the living patient. So this information has really led us to this sort of biological characterization of Alzheimer's disease as it's evolving. Terminology gets a little dicey though, doesn't it? Let's look at the Venn diagram. This is amyloid. This is tau. This is neurodegeneration, and this is cognitive function. And as you can see, they all kind of overlap, but not completely. So the terminology now is Alzheimer's pathologic change if the yellow is involved. So we have amyloid in the brain. Alzheimer's disease is the combination of amyloid, the yellow, and the orange, the tau, that by definition, A plus, T plus. Over here, though, we have Alzheimer's with concomitant non-Alzheimer's changes. So we have amyloid, but we have neurodegeneration markers of something else going on outside the tau sphere. So this is a little bit nonspecific. And here we have non-Alzheimer's pathologic change. And by this, we mean that now we have people who are experiencing neurodegeneration, plus minus tau, they have cognitive impairment, but they have no amyloid on board. So odds are this is not an Alzheimer's process. So that's the theoretical background, the foundation for the ATN, et cetera. Now let's look at some data. So we've been doing this study called the Mayo Clinic Study of Aging since 2004 in Rochester, Minnesota, Olmsted County, Minnesota. We've seen six to 7,000 people. We keep about 3,000 people active at any given time. We replenish them as they drop out or die. We're focusing on people pre-dementia, so normal or mild cognitive impairment. And importantly, it's population-based because we in fact do a random sample of the population. Those of you who may know about the Mayo Clinic exists in a, a small town in Minnesota, and we and another group called the Olmsted Medical Center uh, provides uh, all of the care, basically, for people in our population, in our community. And consequently, we have a system where we can randomly sample these individuals. So we send them letters and invite them to participate. And this gives us a broader spectrum of what's going on vis-a-vis -vis these amyloid tau biomarkers in the general community. So the study started in its current phase back in 2004, and it's now, knock on wood, funded by the National Institute on Aging out to 2024. So we have a good deal of longitudinal data on many of these individuals. When we started the study back in 2004, we recruited 70 to 89 year olds because we thought that's where the action is. That's where you see cognitive impairment in individuals. Basically, that's right. But as time evolved, including the development of amyloid imaging markers, it became apparent from work by uh, Chris Rowe and Victor Villamain in, in uh, Melbourne that uh, the biologic process for Alzheimer's disease probably begins 10 to 20 years before clinical symptoms present themselves. We can detect this now with amyloid imaging. So with that impetus, we dropped down to 50-year-olds and in 2012 started to recruit 50 to 69-year-olds. Then when tau imaging became available based on the work of Heiko and Eva Brock in the 1990s showing that tau pathology can be present in individuals 
in their 40s and their 30s, we drop down to age 30 to try to recruit people as well. So right now, we're recruiting individuals over six decades of aging, not equally, but we're trying to capture the process as it begins as early as possible. So individuals who come into our study get the full meal deal. And by that, I mean they get a complete evaluation regardless of their status. So we don't do a staging. So if your mini mental score is 26 or better, 25 and below, you get this, you get that. We do everything on everybody because we're trying to look at the very earliest presentations of these cognitive difficulties. So individuals, we randomly sample, they come in the top, sign the consent, you go through that, then they get three different branches of evaluation. On the far left here, a nurse or a study coordinator does a, uh, a history with them, a medical history. They go through the patient's medical records, medications, et cetera, and ask the person, if we can visit with somebody who knows the person well. So we get another viewpoint on how they're doing and we generate a clinical dementia rating from that. The middle column then refers to a physician evaluation where we do a medical history, mental status exam, neurologic evaluation. The right-hand column is the cognitive assessment, the neuropsychological tests, four domains, memory, executive function, visual-spatial skills, language, two or three tests in each domain. Each person on these three columns renders his or her independent diagnosis. Here's what I think's going on. That goes into the database. On Tuesday afternoons, we get together every week and we argue on the bottom as to whether this person is normal, impaired, MCI, dementia, okay, well, and we try to take into account everybody's opinion and then render a final uh, consensus diagnosis at the bottom. So over these past 16 years, we've acquired a lot of stuff, a lot of information. Uh, we've seen, again, over 6,000 people ballpark. This is the way they fall out with regard to their diagnoses. Keeping in mind now, the 2% with dementia is not that we have a 2% prevalence in our community. Rather, we've excluded those people when we invite individuals to participate. So the 2% with dementia are people who have developed dementia in the course of our study. The, uh, we've, got, we've got blood on everybody, so we've got DNA, we've got plasma and serum on each person at each visit. We've done many quantitative MR scans, both cross-sectionally and longitudinally. We're hoping to increase the uh, size of the cohort because we have new scientific questions that we want to ask that are requiring finer uh, 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 parcellation of the overall cohort. So we need to increase the overall size. We plan to do that in the future. But the, the items in yellow there are the key ones for this discussion. We have a lot of biomarker data and we're gathering more. We have done CSF, I won't talk about that much today. Happy to address that in questions. We've done a lot of FDG, uh, amyloid scans and tau scans. So here's the structure of the population over time, over the 16 years. These are the people that we have recruited. And as you can see, we focus on 60s, 70s and 80s because still that's where the action is. And here's a depiction of the people who are currently active in the study. Again, preference for the 60s, 70s, and 80s. You'll note that the men and women bars are about equal. That's by design. We set up the sampling scheme to equally sample men and women. So how do the data look? What, what does this mean? If we go out into the community and we apply some of these criteria for these biomarkers, how do they appear? So my colleague, uh, Dr. Rosebud Roberts, a few years ago, looked at the A and the N, the 2011 criteria, and said, well, let's look at how frequently these are appearing, the various combinations, A plus minus, N plus minus, at various ages. And here we're looking at the A minus, N minus curve. So these are individuals who are negative on both parameters, and they uh, as you can imagine, at age 50, that's most everybody. 
but by page 80 and 90, they have uh, diminished considerably. The A plus N minus goes up to about age 70 and then sort of plateaus. The A plus N plus, so these are people who are probably on the Alzheimer's continuum, kind of goes up gradually, but takes off in the 70s and 80s. And then the interesting A plus N minus, these would be people with out Alzheimer's disease, probably, but neurodegeneration due to something else, vascular disease, TDP43, alpha synuclein, whatever. So that was A and N. Then Cliff Jack, our colleague, who's the brains behind the whole organization, did a similar kind of study a couple of years later, now looking at A, T, and N. And I won't bore you to tears with all these different combinations, but they are kind of interesting. And I'll just, here is the A minus, T minus, N minus. Again, most people are negative, 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 Early, I'm sorry, on the bottom here, we should have the ages starting at 50 going up to 90. Uh, but the numbers diminish going over the decades. But then the various combinations fill in in between. And it's the white curve here now, which is A plus, T plus, N plus, probable Alzheimer's disease now, that really is increasing. So the minus, 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 and the plus, plus, plus sort of cross there in the, in the mid-70s, which is what we might imagine with Alzheimer's disease prevalence and incidence. So now, if we define Alzheimer's disease biologically, what does that mean for the numbers? That we, we all know the standard numbers of how much Alzheimer's disease is expected to be in the U.S., how much is expected to be worldwide? I'm sure you have those figures in Australia as well. Well, Cliff then asked the question, what are these numbers going to do if we now change the definition of the disease to the biologic definition? So what are the age and sex specific prevalences given the biomarkers? And again, complicated slides, women on the left, men on the right. But <clears throat> I just want to point out that here is amyloid positivity. The green here is amyloid and tau. So this is the Alzheimer's biologic definition. But in fact, the Alzheimer's, excuse me, sorry, the Alzheimer's clinical syndrome trails behind that so that it's much lower than the biologic definitions of Alzheimer's disease. And you can muse about that as to the political implications, but nevertheless, it appears that the clinical diagnoses undercall the disease vis-a-vis -vis the biologic definition. So the prevalence of A plus T plus exceeds the clinical definition at any age. At age 85, it triples. So the biologic uh, frequency of AD is three times higher than what we see in clinical dementia. And as you can imagine, most of the differences are due to asymptomatic disease. So are these useful? Well, if you're going to do a clinical trial that's aiming at the A or the T, these data are kind of relevant because you want to know how much is out there. And if we try to intervene, are we going to have a significant impact on the underlying frequency of these diseases. So as you can tell, I'm kind of leaning toward that as a reasonable approach to dealing with Alzheimer's disease going forward. Is it perfect? Not at all. We got some problems. So I'm an epidemiologist. I've been doing research in this area for years. So is all of my AD related work regarding risk factors, rates of Alzheimer's disease, is it now invalidated because I didn't have biomarkers? I don't know whether these people were in fact. And I think the answer is yes and no. Of course, it's not invalidated. It's valuable information. But I think we have to think about it a bit more broadly insofar as are we really talking about dementia, the dementia syndrome? Are we talking about MCI, the MCI syndrome? Or are we talking about the specific cause of those syndromes being due to Alzheimer's disease? We may or may not know that. What about the public perception of Alzheimer's disease? This is not trivial. So when you ask somebody on the street, 
Alzheimer's disease. Tell me about it. You think of, and uh, the person might describe an older individual who is cognitively impaired, memory impaired, forgetful, may have some trouble with daily activities, and probably needs some support. That's the picture of Alzheimer's disease. When we go to funding agencies in the US, when we go to Congress and say, we need more funding for Alzheimer's disease, that's the picture that Congress has. We don't want to necessarily disrupt that because that is an important uh, mission that we have. So we have to uh, dance back and forth. Are we talking biological Alzheimer's disease? Are we talking about the clinical syndrome of Alzheimer's disease? And, and this remains uh, a challenge. If we go the biologic route, we got a lot of education. <clears throat> to do. Mm. You know, Peterson, you've talked a lot about these fancy Dan imaging studies, three, four imaging studies on a person. You could talk about cerebrospinal fluid. You've done that too. Isn't that putting a needle in somebody's back? Yes, 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 and yes. So this is a concern. I mean, we can't do this on a public health perspective. We can't do these expensive imaging studies or spinal taps on people uh, in the general population. So that is a limitation. And while we're doing a proof of concept study right now, we really have to think about how this might generalize to the general community. Are the biomarkers validated? That is, you've shown some data suggesting that these are in fact true indices of Alzheimer's disease, but we do we know that? And do we know what these biomarkers mean longitudinally and prospectively? And again, the answer is a little bit yes, but a lot of no. So we really have a great deal of work. We can't jump prematurely to adopt this biomarker definition of the disease until we know really what these biomarkers mean. And in particular, what about diversity? Isn't it the case that most of the studies that have been done on biomarkers are in higher educated individual, higher socioeconomic status people, largely Caucasian? And do we know that the biomarker conclusions you've drawn pertain to the world in general, to general population. What about African Americans in our country? What about Hispanics, Latinx, et cetera? And there's some data coming out on this, but it's slow. There are some suggestions on cerebrospinal fluid measures from Washington University suggesting that the amyloid measures between individuals who are Caucasian, African Americans, probably about the same, but tau measures may be quite different. So if you're now defining the disease on a tau measure, is that appropriate? Is that appropriate across the board? Honest answer, we don't know. And is Alzheimer's disease really just plaques and tangles? Or are there other features involved with it? Now you can define it that way, of course, and say the answer is yes, but aren't there other indices? Aren't there other measures? Aren't there other vascular features, inflammatory features that affect the disease itself? And I've heard a lot about these plasma biomarkers, but is that a way to bail us out of this? Some of these pitfalls at least, because now we may turn a pitfall into the promise. That is, particularly at the uh, AAIC meeting, uh, virtually held in Amsterdam this past summer, and a lot of other publications recently, suggesting that the plasma markers may be substitutes for these expensive imaging and these invasive spinal fluid measures. So a paper published uh, last July in JAMA on the utility of Phosphotau, PTAU217 for Alzheimer's disease in three different cohorts is an example of this. It's not perfect, not the end of the story, but it is suggestive. So what these folks looked at, again, these were individuals from uh, Sweden and from uh, Banner Health in Phoenix, uh, were looking at uh, the performance of PTAU 217. And in this neuropathology cohort on the left scan here, the left image here, we see that the levels of PTAU 217 went up in individuals correlating with their tangle density score on neuropathology. And over on the right side, we see that the antemortem plasma levels of PTAU 217 were elevated in those who had autopsy proven Alzheimer's disease 
versus those who had no Alzheimer's disease. Now comparing PTAU 217 in the BioFinder cohort from Sweden, we see that in fact, when you compare PTAU 217 to other plasma and MRI measures, the PTAU 217 performs better than these other measures. And when you look at PTAU 217 in the plasma uh, relative to other PTAU 217 in the, in the CSF and tau PET, which are sort of gold standards, it does pretty well. So it's really uh, performing quite nicely. And here we look at PTAU 217 compared to tau PET, compared to amyloid PET. And again, the gold curve up to the left indicates that it is doing as well or better than other measures with those PET indices as gold standards. And finally, we look at the Colombian cohort for autosomal dominant disease, and we see that the PTAU measure in the carriers went up over age, whereas in the non-carriers, it remained relatively flat. So the implication suggestion from this study was that PTAU 217 may in fact be a pretty good surrogate for amyloidosis and tauopathy in the brain. Now, that's what you would come away from that paper. The reality is maybe there are a lot of questions out there in the field. Is it PTAU 217? Is it PTAU 181? What about PTAU 231? Is, what about amyloid measures in the plasma? What about A beta? What about A beta 42 to 40 ratios using mass spec in the, uh, in the plasma? And there recently has been a CLIA approved test for Alzheimer's disease using blood uh, measures for uh, mat using mass spec for A beta 42 to 40, adding age and adding Apple E status gives you pretty good area under the curve in the data that have been presented thus far. So I think the jury is still out with regard to which plasma measures and which platforms to use to generate those plasma measures, but it certainly is exciting, and it might get around a lot of these issues of certainly diversity, inclusion, low and middle income countries. We may be able to do biomarker research much more inexpensively and efficiently in these uh, settings. So let me fix, finish up then by saying, uh, it's more complicated than you might guess. At the end of the day, is it Alzheimer's disease? Well, yes and no. So work from Kentucky, uh, Pete Nelson and colleagues have demonstrated the most common pathologic explanation for people with cognitive impairment in their 70s and 80s is multifactorial. We kind of all know this. So cerebrovascular disease, part primary age-related tauopathy, Lewy bodies, hippocampus sclerosis, TDP43, argyrophilic grains. This is a combination that appears in most people. So it's not that simple. So I wrap up with this slide because I think it, for me at least, sort of captures where we are in the field. If we're dealing with the clinical spectrum, cognitively normal, mild cognitive impairment, and dementia. Okay, if people are becoming cognitively impaired, why? Well, could be A beta. I've talked a lot about amyloid in the brain. I think it's important. What about tau? Yes, tau is a factor also that may contribute to cognitive impairment. But alpha synuclein, what we see in dementia with Lewy bodies, Parkinson's disease, dementia, MCI due to PDD, et cetera. Uh, uh, alpha synuclein is a player. TDP43 can present a clinical picture that looks a lot like amnestic mild cognitive impairment. It really uh, appears like this is early Alzheimer's disease, except the patient doesn't get worse. I mean, the memory gets worse, but the person doesn't evolve into dementia in the next three to five to eight to 10 years, maybe because the culprit is TDP43 in the hippocampus. And of course, vascular disease is very common. Varies among population, but it's there. And the vascular contribution of small vessel disease, congophilic angiopathy, and large vessel disease all contribute to 
create a picture of cognitive impairment due to vascular disease. And then we have to be humble. There are other things out there, I'm sure, that we haven't discovered yet, and we'd like to uh, gain a better appreciation for them. So this is Alzheimer's disease. Is it important? Absolutely. It's a very important component of cognitive impairment in aging. But is it the end-all, be-all? Maybe not. And maybe when you look at some of the recent clinical trials that have been less successful than we would like, they're dealing with one of these components, but we don't know the degree of the other components contributing to the clinical picture. And hence, some of these studies may be doomed to failure uh, from the get-go. So, if we have the clinical spectrum in the middle, we have these different pathologic entities around the outside. <clears throat> Where we're going, I think, in the field is to try to gain biomarkers of each and every one of these components. We're pretty good with amyloid. We're pretty good with tau. We've got work to do with alpha synuclein and TDP43. Vascular diseases, Dr. Satchdev knows very well, is, you know, it's, uh, I think we're pretty far down the road there that in fact we can characterize different degrees of vascular disease and their contributions to the cognitive impairment picture. So I think that we're farther along the road there than we are perhaps with uh, TDP and alpha synuclein, but we still have work to do. Why do we want to do this? Because ultimately, we'd like to develop therapies, therapies for each of these components. So, I mean, I may be blue skying it and I may be delusional here, but wouldn't it be nice if three, five, eight years down the road, patient with clinical cognitive impairment, maybe in the mild stages, came into the physician, said, gee, I'm not thinking as well as I used to. Physician does an exam, evaluates and said, I agree, you're not where you used to be. Let's get this blood-based panel that will tell you, do you have amyloid, do you have tau, do you have alpha-synuclein, et cetera, on board. And the best news is, if you do, Here's what we can do about it. And I think ultimately we're going to be at combination therapy down the road. Combination for maybe individual pathologic components, but combination for the multiplicity of po potential pathologic elements that may be contributing to a person's cognitive impairment. We do that in hypertension. We do it in HIV AIDS. We do it in some cancers. So I don't think this is outlandish with regard to the approach of the clinical spectrum being caused by multifactorial pathologies. So I think the framework is feasible. I think it may move the field further. I think the biomarkers are becoming increasingly important. The clinical diagnosis remains vital. You and I as clinicians still have people come in our office and say, hey, doc, I'm not remembering as well as I used to. They don't come in with saying, you know, I've got this alpha synuclein, I got this TDP43, what about this amyloid? That's how they come. They come compare, complaining of symptoms, and that's where the clinicians are still very vital in this entire uh, uh, stream of uh, evaluation. Multiple copathologies, though, are the rule rather than the exception. So we as clinicians and we as scientists still have a lot of work to do. There's some job security here if you want to look at it from a positive perspective. So these are my colleagues at the three Mayo Clinic sites uh, that contributed, generated a lot of the work that I reported on the Mayo Clinic study of aging, and I really owe them a debt of gratitude for their excellent work in, in all of these various areas. And again, I want to thank uh, uh, Perminder and, and the team at Chiba for this kind invitation. It's, uh, it's been my pleasure to participate today, and I look forward to a, uh, a question answer session that's coming. So again, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Sharon. That was a wonderful lecture. Uh, I actually congratulate you on the clarity of your thinking and also I think the ability to communicate to a diverse group. I think I think everyone went away probably will go away uh, with, with something new that they've learned. And I, I mean, I learned a lot and also saw some of the new data that you generated. I didn't realize that your study had actually gone to over 6,000 participants uh, and it's, it's growing. Uh, 
And we have a, a number of questions. As you can see from the questions that they've come from all over the world, really, and the majority from Australia, but also from your, some of your colleagues in the United States. So you probably, some names that you probably recognize in any case. So maybe we start off with Vivica's question, and that relates to normality, really. When you say a lot of people with A, beta, and tau in their brains are normal. Uh, certainly pathologically, we've known that, uh, that people are non-demented, we say, and then they have pathology. What about your cases? Do you think they're really normal or are you not testing them enough or uh, you have a high threshold for normality in a way? No, sure. That, that That's a very good question. I mean, what is the threshold for normality, and not only on the biomarker side that I alluded to, but normality on the clinical side from a cognitive perspective, from memory, from attention, concentration, functionality and all. And it really does become complicated because as you and your team have evaluated people out in the community, you know that it's not simple uh, by any means. So We've put some artificial thresholds in with regard to what do we call normal, what do we not call normal. Now, you and uh, and many of your colleagues uh, are aware of the various rating scales out there, the FAQ certainly, but the CDR as well. And I think we have... Uh, we do a CDR, clinical dementia rating, on everybody because we ask people, do you have someone who knows you well, who might be able to contribute information about your function? And 84, 5, 6% of people will give us somebody else who knows something about them. And when we do that, and then we do the cognitive assessment, you'll be interested to, to realize, for better or worse, that when we classify somebody as, say, having mild cognitive impairment, about a third of those, 30% or a little over 30% of those people will be a CDR zero. So meaning that the CDR is comprised of information from the participant, from the study partner, and then from the rater. And when we put all that information together with the neuropsychological information, we think that uh, some of these people may be edging toward uh, abnormality. So getting to the issue of are these normal people normal or not, where, well, it's, it's an arbitrary call, but I think we still have a lot to learn about the earliest indices of what might be cognitive impairment. And then you get the age associated uh, changes that occur, which begs the question, what is aging, which you are addressing probably as well as anybody. So it, it's, it's not trivial at all as to where somebody's normal or abnormal. Thank you, thank you very much. Now, the other question I guess uh, we take is uh, early onset versus late onset analysis. Do you think the pathway is similar? Um, interesting question. I think probably not. And, and I mean that by, by uh, the clinical perspective and perhaps even by the biomarker perspective, although you can, you can define the latter as being similar. But it seems like, uh, for example, on the biomarker side, the tau may be more abnormal, may be more aggressive and may r rise more rapidly in young onset cases than in older onset cases. And you may have a more aggressive clinical profile. Some of my colleagues here uh, have been identifying what they call the disexecutive syndrome form of Alzheimer's disease, the clinical profile, and find this more prevalent in young onset individuals than in later onset individuals. So the cognitive profile might be somewhat different in younger individuals than in older individuals. And again, the biomarker play out may be somewhat different as well. Now, if you look at the Diane study, autosomal dominant, you get a little different picture. You do see the biomarkers play out generally in the same uh, uh, pattern. Uh, but again, the tau may be more aggressive in the younger onset than in the older onset. Yeah. So just follow on, on that. Um, so we, we understanding from this, from the biomarker pathway that you described, we're looking at say a hypothesized pathway where you start off with amyloid, then you have tau, and then you have neurodegeneration. And the relationship between tau and neurodegeneration is stronger than the relationship between amyloid and neurodegeneration. Now, do you see participants in your studies where you have amyloid and neurodegeneration, which you have you cannot attribute to vascular pathology or some other pathology, perhaps. But do you think that amyloid itself may be associated with neurodegeneration? 
I, I think there are those individuals who have the amyloid substrate present, do not have tau yet, or may never have tau, but do have neurodegeneration. So the question is, is it one of those other features, other pathologic entities that contribute to the N, which may or may not be related to the amyloid at all. But on the other hand, I think that if you take, say, an A plus, T minus, N plus person, and you compare that to an A minus T minus N plus person. So neurodegeneration only. I think the former will be a little more impaired. So I think the amyloid plays out very slowly. I think it does have a clinical impact, but it plays out over many years, but it does reduce perhaps your resilience at the end of the day and such that when you have these other neuropathologic hits, be it vascular, be it alpha synuclein TDP, you may have less reserve if you have amyloid on board than if you don't have amyloid on board. But I think the complex, uh, I think these, these uh, uh, unusual combinations are instructive to us as to what's going on in the brain. Excellent, now that's, that's very interesting. Uh, now the other, the few questions on neurodegeneration. I think you didn't have time to talk about the biomarkers of neurodegeneration, some of the newer ones like NFL, et cetera. Would you like to comment on that? Is that something that you were progressing about? Yeah, yes, I think in particular NFL, so neurofilament light, I think is a very interesting index of neurodegeneration. And in fact, I should update that slide that says A, T, and N, that in fact, total tau may not be the best fluid measure of neurodegeneration. NFL may actually be a better index of progression on the neuropathologic spectrum. It's nonspecific though. You see NFL go up in multiple sclerosis, in ALS, as well as in Alzheimer's disease. So I think it's a nonspecific index of neural degeneration due to, due to whatever. The other biomarkers that are in development, I think people are working on alpha-synuclein measures, both in the spinal fluid. You know, in, in, uh, Im from the imaging perspective, at least with regard to Lewy body disease, DAT scanning, dopamine transporter, spec scanning can be informative about the, the component of a Lewy bodies. Again, not commonly done, but can be helpful in some circumstances. I think the spinal fluid measures of alpha synuclein are coming along, but they need a lot of work. Most of the ones that we've seen recently are, are positive, but you see those only later in the developed disease. So you'd like some nascent markers of Lewy body. And TDP-43, again, I'm not, a, I'm not a biofluid scientist, but I guess that's a tough nut to crack. Uh, people, John Trojanowski, Virginia Lee at the University of Pennsylvania are spending a lot of time working on that. I don't think we've seen those markers come forward, but I'd really like to see as a, you know, that uh, speculative slide at the end with a playing out of all the biomarkers, it would really be helpful to all of us and most importantly to our patients, I think, if we were able to develop uh, reliable and valid biomarkers of these other entities as well. And you've done a lot of work with vascular disease. So you know the MR signature is really pretty good for, mm -hmm. for the most part with regard to the degree of vascular uh, uh, damage. So I think it brings us to uh, this interesting question. And uh, I suppose also, uh, Richard, our colleague Richard Lipton from New York asked this question as well. Really, is to what? Uh oh, what I'm is, in, I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> what is what is prime time for, for these biomarkers? So, if we were a clinician, for example, I mean, working in a maybe a high end clinic, not not in the community, uh, you so well resourced, you have access to PET, you have access to CSA biomarkers, and also maybe blood biomarkers. What would you do if you had a patient a difficult? Uh, complex patient? Well, I, I, uh, it's a good question. And, and I think um, uh, I, I lean toward the imaging side of the house, but that's because we do imaging and not because it's necessarily better. You know, the spinal fluid and imaging might give you slightly different pictures of the underlying pathophysiology. So while I kind of lump them together and, and uh, imply that they, they do give the same information, that may not be the case. In fact, spinal fluid is really a measure of ongoing turnover at a given point in time. So it's sort of a cross-sectional measure about what's being produced, what's being removed from the system, and what are the levels at this point in time. 
imaging biomarkers sort of give you a cumulative index of deposition over years. So a positive amyloid spinal fluid means something. A positive imaging amyloid PET marker gives you some other information. They probably correlate well with each other, but not necessarily. When we've, when we've looked at combinations of spinal fluid and imaging, we find that generally they, they correlate with each other. So you have positive, positive, and negative, negative. But there are some interesting data from the other quadrants, namely the spinal fluid positive imaging negative quadrant for say amyloid. What does that mean? Well, I think the field and certainly the Diane folks at Washington University with the autosomal dominant cases have suggested that the spinal fluid may actually be an index of positivity of amyloid before the imaging. And you will see uh, that, that quadrant of positive spinal fluid negative imaging. However, it may also be that there are other contributing factors to that quadrant. Namely, there may be some people who are just low spinal fluid producers. So you get a low amyloid A-beta 42 in the spinal fluid, but those people just are not producers at the same level. I'm not sure how big a uh, uh, component that might be, but I think it is. The other thing that we've been looking at, my colleagues at, at Mayo, are CSF dynamics. Now, you know, in the old days, we called this normal pressure hydrocephalus. But I think more broadly, we're talking about CSF dynamics influencing that quadrant. We've seen a bunch of people, not a bunch, some people who have had um, negative uh, or normal CSF A beta 42, P tau to A beta 42 ratios. So the ratio seems to be most sensitive of P tau to A beta 42. That ratio is normal, but their A beta level is low. So is one out of proportion. And when we look at those cases, these are people that are being evaluated clinically for possible normal pressure hydrocephalus. Others have shown that in, in uh, uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus, A beta levels are low, tau levels are low. You shunt the person and the levels return to normal. So I think we've got a lot to learn about the A beta imaging kind of dynamics and what they tell us. So uh, I think there's a lot to be learned. But getting back to Richard's question about what do you do in the clinic, it would be nice if the blood tests come to fruition. I think the plasma markers are very interesting. The field's kind of jumping on them. I, I hope not too prematurely, but I think we need to validate them. But it might be down the road that you do the blood markers first. So you do, say, uh, a plasma P-tau 217. And if it's elevated, then you go on to the next, uh, say, imaging modality or the spinal fluid modality. You kind of triage the workup. You don't just do carte blanche imaging and spinal fluid on everybody, but you might be able to develop a, a triage network that would be more cost effective, less invasive, and, and equally informative with blood markers first, then maybe imaging or spinal fluid. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. I know we, we've run out of time. We're just a few minutes over. I might just take the final question from Henry, Henry Rodati, and that is about uh, positivity of amyloid with aging. As you see, you, go, you have 90 plus people and you're actually closing towards going up towards the 100% the mark, really. So right, the first question, right. I guess, is does everyone deposit amyloid as they age? So it, that, would everyone be positive? They live long enough. And what does that tell us about amyloid deposition vis-a-vis uh, -vis aging? Right. And, and is it really a pathologic marker yeah, or is it a marker it, yeah. of aging it, and all that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, let me turn the question around to Henry and say, will everybody develop cognitive impairment, MCI dementia, don't call it Alzheimer's disease, but MCI dementia, if they live long enough? And the answer is probably no. But I think the vast majority of people probably will, degree, will develop some degree of cognitive impairment. Amyloid similarly goes up. Tau goes up. And, and so all of these combinations go up together. And I think the interesting question is the flip side. Now, you've been doing it. Henry's been doing it. We've been doing it. What about resilience? What about those people with what is cognitive reserve? What's brain reserve? Why do some people uh, tolerate 
that degree of pathologic involvement of the brain and still seem to be functioning quite well. So I think the other side of the coin offers some interesting questions and hopefully some answers for us regarding that. But I think that amyloidosis, getting back to Henry's question, in late life is probably less impactful on a person's cognitive outcome than it is, say, earlier in life. So if you have a an elevated uh, amyloid PET level when you're 65, I think that's much more ominous than if you have that at 85 or 95. And what does that mean about the role of amyloid? It may not be, it may not be equally deleterious in, at all stages of life with regard to cognitive function. I think it is a player. I mean, I know a lot of people are saying, you know, maybe it's a tombstone, maybe it's uh, we're barking up the wrong tree here. Maybe, but but I think it is a player, and certainly I think it's uh, it gets into a whole other discussion, which fortunately we don't have time for. That is, should amyloid removing drugs be approved? I mean, I think the you know the the antibodies that are out there remove amyloid from the brain. The million dollar question: Does that make any difference? Do people get any better? Uh, my personal answer is uh, N of one here. I, I think it does have an effect, I think, but I think it's a small effect and I think it plays out over a great deal of time. So uh, I, I think Henry's question is, is very well taken for the field with regard to the role of amyloid and cognition and aging uh, as, as we all get there. So thank you so much. There are a number of other questions. I don't think we have time to go over them. I mean, there's a question of race. Uh, I think you covered that partially, at least uh, in terms of your American population. Sorry. There's one, one comment. Yeah. I, I saw one of the questions, and I did want to clarify something sure. I should say and I don't say, is that when we make our diagnoses in our study, artificially, as we do it, because of the study design, we're blinded each time to the previous diagnosis and to the previous cognitive profile of that person. So you'll see a fair amount of bounce in things, but I think it allows us to evaluate the, 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 each of these tools independently at each. Uh, at yeah, each I think Nikki Caution wanted to ask that. That's a more practical yeah. kind of question you. for our consensus studies. So thank you. Thank you so much uh, once again. And uh, uh, we, we, I mean, look forward to maybe future uh, interaction with you and of course learning from you uh, and um, just certainly certainly take care of yourself and uh, hope the COVID situation improves uh, soon in in the U.S. and uh, thank you thank you so much Parminder I, I truly appreciate the invitation from you your colleagues my friends uh, my friends there your your team that uh, helped me that walked me through all this so Heidi and Lori and the whole group there so thanks so much I'd be happy to come back anytime wonderful Thank you. Bye-bye then. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye now.